Hello and welcome back to chapter 8 in Alternate Care Systems. We are picking up on page 293 with reimbursement and funding. Reimbursement issues facing inpatient substance abuse facilities are essentially the same as those for other types of inpatient mental health services. The funding stream for outpatient substance abuse treatment is complex. However, involving several government agencies at the state and federal levels, as well as private insurance companies and client fees. In a community, which is your outpatient or residential substance abuse treatment center, revenue may come from any combination of the following sources. Client fees. In the public sector, client fees do not account for a major portion of revenue, but they are collected generally on a sliding scale basis. Family size and income are both taken into consideration in determining the client's copayments. Then you have private insurance. Individual insurance policies may cover substance abuse services at the inpatient or the outpatient level. In public facilities, the insurance company usually is billed first before any federal insurance is billed or any applicable sliding scale copayment is determined. Then we have Medicaid. Medicaid programs cost, program costs are shared by the federal and state governments. Therefore, eligibility, reimbursement rates, and payment mechanism for substance abuse treatments vary from state to state. Then we have Medicare. Medicare covers a limited amount of substance abuse treatments for eligible clients. Services such as inpatient treatment, outpatient treatment, and detoxification are covered for a preset number of days or visits. And then we have other government funding sources. Several federal agencies administer a variety of block grants and contracts to support substance abuse treatment or prevention. The agency that administers the Federal Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment, SAPT, grants is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, calling this SAMHSA. These grants and others usually are awarded to individual states, which in turn distribute the money to eligible community agencies. In some of these agencies, federal funding may account for up to 75% or more of total revenue. All right, moving down to information management. Other types of healthcare settings share many of the information management issues faced by substance abuse facilities. This makes sense because the purpose of maintaining client information in substance abuse facilities is basically the same as in other facilities. To facilitate the documentation of care and services provided, to support quality reviews activity, to ensure appropriate financial reimbursement, to meet all legal requirements, and to meet a variety of administrative, research, and educational needs. Nevertheless, a few issues are either unique to substance abuse or are found more commonly in this setting. Each substance abuse facility has its own distinct flow of client information from the time of admission through discharge and follow-up care. This information flow may or may not include computer-based information, but it should reflect the course of treatment provided to the clients. And you can see in figure 8.8-5 on page 295, this is the flow of information within a client's record. We start with the intake process and go through the assessment, and then we drop down into program level activities for the development of the treatment plan, documentation of care, documentation of the discharge summary, development of continuing care plan, and then aftercare. So for your test, um, you will be asked to match um, the activity to the purpose of the activity um, from this uh, figure on page 295. All right, moving on to coding and classification over on page um, 296. Um, on this slide, they list the multi-axle format, um, but when we get down into the actual text, DSM-5 does not use this five-axis um, they don't use these five axes to report these conditions or problems anymore. So let's get into this. Selecting a coding or classification system for a substance abuse treatment facility depends on the level of care provided by the facility and the type of funding used to support its programs. In general, when ICD and CPT codes are required for reimbursement purposes, the codes are assigned following the same guidelines and conventions that apply to other inpatient and outpatient settings. The one significant difference in substance abuse coding is the availability of DSM-5. DSM-5 is a classification and diagnostic tool for mental disorders that was developed by the American Psychiatric Association. DSM-5 consists of three major components. 
Number one, diagnostic classification. Number two, diagnostic criteria. And three, descriptive text. The diagnostic classification is a list of mental health disorders from which the clinician can choose. These are broad categories derived from an ICD, ICD coding system. The diagnostic criteria help the clinician arrive at a diagnosis by identifying duration of the problem, symptoms, and in some situations, a lack of symptoms. The descriptive text provides additional information about each disorder in 12 different categories, such as diagnostic features, prevalence, development, and course, and so on. Although DSM-4 and earlier editions used the five different axes to report different types of conditions, problems, and levels of functioning, DSM-5 no longer uses this multi-axial approach. However, payers have been accustomed to using Axis 5, which was the global assessment of functioning, in earlier versions of DSM to make determinations of medical necessity. So it is likely that a transitional period will remain for a time in which some elements of DSM-4 will continue to be used for administrative purposes. All right, so we're going to move over to data sets on page 297. In 1988, Congress passed Public Law 100-690, which required collection of data on the national incidence and prevalence of mental illness and substance abuse. The message that Congress sent by passing this law was that the states had to be able to substantiate the need for federal block grant money. The National Institute of Drug Abuse and the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism were, at the time, the federal agencies administering a national database of substance abuse client information to meet the substance abuse reporting component of the law. But in 1995, this function was taken over by SAMHSA, which has developed the Drug and Alcohol Services Information System, or DASIS, an evolution of the earlier reporting systems. The goal of DASIS is to provide one data system that provides national and state level data on substance abuse clients and on the facilities that receive federal grants or contracts to provide substance abuse a treatment. DASIS includes three components, the Treatment Episode Data Set or TEDS, the National Survey of Substance Abuse Treatment Services, and the Inventory of Substance Abuse Treatment Services. All right, moving down to electronic information at the bottom of 297. Generalizing about electronic information systems within the substance abuse treatment community today is difficult because these systems vary greatly from facility to facility. Some treatment programs in the United States have sophisticated electronic client information systems and other programs have limited electronic applications. This variability sometimes comes from the differences in levels of care and funding sources. On one hand, a substance abuse treatment unit within a progressive acute care hospital will benefit from the hospital-wide information systems that are in place. On the other hand, a public community treatment program with limited funds may not have much in the way of computer development. Public community treatment programs are working together to develop a standardized electronic record. This will allow the agencies to pool their resources and create a set of electronic forms that are standardized throughout the state. With the greater use of electronic records, the intake process for clients has become more efficient. Also, the flow of information throughout the course of treatment is more effective. All right, so let's move over to quality assessment on 299. Providers of substance abuse treatment must ensure that they offer quality care and service. The quality assessment of imp and improvement activities within substance abuse treatment facilities often are related to the level of care provided and whether the facility seeks joint commission or CARF accreditation. In some states, specific Medicaid standards also address the need for an organized quality assessment and improvement process. A substance abuse treatment unit in a joint commission accredited hospital would participate in the hospital-wide performance improvement program. Regardless of the setting, a substance abuse treatment program seeking processes for improvement may consider consensus-based and evidence-based treatment guidelines available at SAMHSA Center for Substance Abuse Treatment as a means to identify effective treatment practices to which its own processes can be compared. Another source for evidence-based interventions for both substance abuse and mental health is SAMHSA's National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices. 
This is an online searchable database of interventions and treatments that have been demonstrated to be effective. SAMHSA offers the National Outcome Measures, or NOMS, as a reporting system to create a source for reviewing outcome measures on the national level. All right, dropping down to utilization management. Providers of substance abuse treatment, just as other healthcare providers, must demonstrate fiscal responsibility and solid clinical decision making based on the client's individual need. Facilities must ensure that each client receives the level of care appropriate to his or her severity of illness. As a general rule, clients should be served at the least intensive level that will meet their treatment objectives, such as outpatient therapy, and should move to a more intensive level, such as residential treatment, only when it is justified by their specific needs. Severity indexes and other treatment review instruments also have been developed for evaluating treatment and utilizing services within the substance abuse treatment community. The American Society of Addiction Medicine publishes a placement criteria manual that defines levels of care for the specific criteria that should be used in placing adolescent and adult clients in the appropriate treatment setting. Another instrument that is used in the utilization management and to facilitate client care is the Addiction Severity Index, which was developed in 1979. ASI was designed to be administered through an interview process by a trained technician to measure seven substance abuse related problem areas, medical status, drug use, alcohol use, employment and support, legal status, family social status, and psychosocial status. Data from the client interview are tabulated and result in a severity score for the patient. The score can be stated as a 10 point severity rating for clinical use or as a mathematically weighted score for use as outcomes measures in research studies. All right, let's move on down to risk management here. Risk management is defined as a four-step process designed to identify, evaluate, and resolve the actual and possible sources of loss. The four steps are risk identification, risk evaluation, risk handling, and risk monitoring. Formal risk management programs are found in the inpatient substance abuse treatment settings more often than they are found in outpatient settings. Still, many other relevant legal issues, such as confidentiality and release of information, court-ordered treatment, and commitments, are commonly associated with all levels of substance abuse treatment. Moving over to confidentiality and release of information. I'm not going to cover this whole page, just going to cover a little bit of it, so be sure to read. Again, you need to read this entire chapter. Confidentiality of client information is vital in substance abuse treatment facilities. Clients who seek alcohol and drug abuse prevention and treatment services must be assured of the greatest possible privacy because of the stigma attached to the labels alcoholic and addict, and because the use of illicit drugs and Underage minors use of alcohol constitutes crimes. Clients must believe they will not be subject to a law enforcement investigation if they seek treatment. In the early 70s, the federal government enacted two laws that were written to guarantee this strict level of confidentiality. The Comprehensive Alcohol Abuse and Abuse and Alcohol Prevention, Treatment and Rehabilitation Act of 1970 and the Drug Abuse and Treatment Act of 1972. The federal regulations, known as 42 CFR, which is Code of Federal Regulations, Part 2, Confidentiality of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Patient Records, that implemented these confidential statutes were issued in 1975 and then were revised in 87 and then 95. The regulations in 42 CFR Part 2 are more restrictive than the privacy provisions of HIPAA. Except under certain specific conditions, disclosure of information concerning any client who is seen in a federally assisted alcohol or drug abuse program is strictly prohibited. Going over to 302, no information about a substance abuse client should be disclosed unless the facility can state how these exceptions permit disclosure. When information is released using a patient authorization, the authorization must contain the specific items to be considered valid. And dropping down into our court order treatment, a portion of the substance abuse client population enters treatment as a result of a court order. The court order may come from a conviction for driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs, 
and in some states, substance abuse assessment is mandated by law for all persons with a DUI conviction. And if the assessment indicates that the individual needs further treatment, this treatment is also mandated. Typically, if the DUI client fails to fulfill an established court order assessment and treatment protocol, he or she will not be reissued a driver's license. Thus, it is necessary to establish good working relationship between the substance abuse treatment centers and the legal system. One common practice is the development of an active partnership with the municipal court system. A treatment center employee may be assigned to, to be present in court during the DUI hearings to facilitate the enrollment of the court-ordered clients. All necessary consents and authorizations to release information back to the court can be signed and appropriate fees collected before the patient leaves the courthouse. DUI convictions are not the only court procedures that lead to court-ordered substance abuse treatment. Examples of situations that might result in a court order for treatment are child abuse, possession of illegal drugs, sexual assault, underage alcohol consumption, burglary, or assault when the court deems that the perpetrator's substance abuse was a factor. And in regarding our involuntary commitments, this is a legal process by which individuals who are deemed to be a danger to themselves or to others may be admitted to a treatment program even though they refuse or cannot consent to treatment. Involuntary commitment is governed by state statutes and the criteria and procedures vary from state to state. All right, we're going to move on to the role of the health information manager. This role is becoming increasingly important in substance abuse treatment settings. The changing healthcare environment requires that substance abuse facilities collect, analyze, and maintain timely and reliable client information. Managed care organizations and other payers, including the federal government, want proof that their enrollees are receiving quality services at the lowest possible cost. Opportunities for the health information manager within substance abuse facilities are found in the areas of traditional, traditional client record management, risk management, utilization management, quality improvement, release of information services, client rights coordination, and especially in electronic client record systems. Even though electronic health records first appeared in the 1960s, they are still underutilized in many treatment facilities. As the need to be more efficient in providing treatment and the need to be more cost effective with the funding that is utilized by a facility becomes more apparent, the need for adequate electronic records will also become more important. In addition to adequate record keeping, health information professionals must play a role in collecting and reporting data for statistical purposes and for reimbursement purposes, such as outcome measures. Although also Medicare has offered incentives for providers that utilize electronic health records. The health information manager has an important role in planning, developing, and implementing electronic health records. Another challenging role for the healthcare manager working in substance abuse treatment is to be an advocate for client confidentiality. Most health information managers in substance abuse facilities are confidentially, confidentiality experts and must be thoroughly familiar with the federal regulations governing alcohol and drug abuse treatment records. Health information managers can assist in developing policies to meet the requirements of existing and newly developed record regulations. All right, so continue on reading through the trends and the summary of the chapter. And again, make sure you read the entire chapter. Um, and of course, as always, you're going to ensure that you do your quick check and test yourself. And um, happy reading and happy studying.